Hello everyone, Dom here, back with another stream. Uh, thanks for joining us on this Bank Holiday Monday. Uh, I set this stream time uh, before, a few weeks back, and I, I didn't realise it was Bank Holiday Monday, so I really appreciate the panel uh, being with us today, and for you guys streaming in, we'll of course have this on YouTube um, and across our socials afterwards, so you can listen back, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, watching this live. Um, this is a, a, a bit of a different topic for us today, a very important one, uh, close to my heart as well. Um, I have my dad, I have my dad, I have an uncle and a few other people in my family disabled. So um, for me, one of the things I love about esports is it's inclusive, it's open to everyone regardless of gender, age, ability, that kind of thing. And uh, we're going to talk about this today. Is esports accessible for... Um, uh, disabled and, and neurodivergent uh, people and um, so without further ado I'm going to go into the panel here uh, I'm just going to uh, unmute these lovely people on Zoom uh, so I'm joined by uh, Max, Jake and Terry uh, thanks very much for joining us uh, today guys Good afternoon Afternoon, afternoon. Hello. Thanks for having us Thank you so maybe, guys, you can start by introducing yourselves. If we go around clockwise, so Max first, then Jake, and then Terry, tell us a bit about what you do in esports and gaming. Yeah, uh, so my name is Max. I'm the team manager of E-Team Brit. We are the esports um, subsidy, as it were, of Team Brit, who are a motor racing team made up of entirely disabled drivers. And, um, and that is the same for us as an esports team. All of our drivers have a disability, whether that be a mental or physical one. Um, and yeah, so, and that's what we do. We're sort of just out there to demonstrate um, that disability isn't holding us back when it comes to competing with, with able-bodied drivers. Fantastic. Jake? Uh, yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Mackey. I'm the Games Partnership Manager at Autistica. Um, and Autistica is the uh, UK's uh, leading autism research charity. Um, so everything uh, we do is to uh, create uh, life-changing uh, research and solutions for autistic people and their families. Um, so I joined them in 2019 to set up Autistica Play, which is uh, an initiative directed specifically at the games industry, those who create games and those who play games, um, specifically autistic people, neurodiverse people. Okay, cool. And Terry, uh, nice. you're no stranger to our streams, Terry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, uh, my name's Terry. Um, by day, I'm a digital marketer for an, a CGI animation company. And uh, the rest of the time, um, I'm a British Esports Association game advisor for Overwatch. Um, I also um, have been a volunteer with Special Effect. Probably, it's probably been getting on about four years now. So I attended six or seven events, um, a few live streams and stuff as well. Um, so I'm here mostly for that to kind of represent Special Effect. Yeah. Great stuff. So all, all from different backgrounds. And again, I appreciate you um, joining us for, uh, for this panel. Uh, guys, I'll jump straight into it. You know, do, do you think, you know, esports is technically open to all, as, as I was saying earlier, um, but how inclusive and accessible do you feel it is at the moment? Do you feel, you know, it's it's, it's very open, It's, it's you, you you have no problems, and the, the people that f follow you guys, you know, whether it's autistic or eating, Brit, special effect, they don't see many, you know, they don't seem to be treated any differently or how open do you feel esports is um, to disabled and neurodiverse people? I think for from my perspective, I've seen that the attitude certainly from those within the industry has been overwhelmingly positive. I think areas that the the industry falls down a little bit is maybe in some of the accessibility with regards to hardware. So for example, with ourselves, we've had, uh, we've created a hand control system, which would allow uh, drivers who may be par paraplegic or, or have uh, difficulty in the movement of their legs can, can use a steering wheel system. Um, and I, I don't know about uh, the wider community, but I find that that's probably the one area that's probably 
been um, let down a bit by by the industry as a whole. But I, I think the attitudes themselves are are overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, I think the hardware's got <clears throat> a little while yet to catch up. Um, you've got the eye tracking software now, which is being used for some of the racing. Um, and be using that in one of at Forza at one of the events, um, and it is really good. Um, but I think to try, it's going to take a little while to be able to get that technology up to the same level as some of the com competitive people. Um, just to try and level the playing field, which I know is kind of the saying for special effect anyway. But that that's kind of it. You don't want there to be too much of a difference between whether you have um, difficulties playing a game or you don't. Mm. Um, it's about so that you can play together, um, compete together or against each other and have fun while you're doing it. Um, but when it comes to the higher level competitive stuff, I think there, there, is, there does need to be a little bit more. Um, hopefully in the next year or two, there'll be um, a few more progressions in the systems, um, in the hardware to have it access more accessible. Mm. Would you echo that, Jake? What, what are your yeah, views? so I think um, just carrying on what uh, Terry was saying, you know, um, when you talk about the <clears throat> general accessibility for just esports in general, it's like a amateur level. Um, you know, it's quite accessible. I think at this point, um, uh, everything can always be done better. But I think um, the last few years, I've definitely seen some some uh, major steps in terms of accessibility and kind of awareness and um, <clears throat> the way in which the the messages are communicated. What with um, uh, what's it? Uh, Lion winning the Grandmaster for um, Hearthstone last year, being the mm -hmm. first female. I mean, that's a that's a major awareness piece right there uh, when it comes to gender. Um, when it comes to uh, physical disability, I don't have that much experience, but uh, for neurodiversity, um, obviously, like Tira was saying, when it comes to the um, the elites, the, the champions, then there is something to talk about um, accessibility and kind of the, as you said, level the playing field uh, point of view. Um, mm -hmm. How, when, when it comes to, for example, when it comes to neurodiversity, obviously, it, it's such a diverse range of possibilities and um a way in which we can create something that's accessible for all is most definitely going to be ultimately challenging. Um, but there are, of course, things that are being done and things that can be done uh, to become more accessible. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, Jake, as, as someone at Autistica, maybe for those watching this, there may be a few young people or uh, others watching and they don't know what neurodiversity is. Um, because this was a term that sprung up, you know, I've only been aware of this term for a few years. So are you able to maybe give us a brief overview for those of us that, that don't know? Yeah, so I mean, um, the same with physiological being uh, physical, mm. uh, neurological being um, the mind, and then uh, diversity just being um, variations. So it right. basically just means uh, variations of the mind. So um, as with uh, different languages, cultures, religions, diversity of us as a as a human populace, mm. there's obviously diversity in uh, physical abilities. There's diversity of uh, mental capabilities, uh, which is neurodiversity. Mm. Absolutely, great answer, great answer. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but there doesn't seem to be an esports tournament specifically for disabled or neurodiverse people now do you, is this something you would like to see or would you prefer not to segregate um because you know in esports people of all abilities can take part you know and i'll come on to some pro gamers and amateur gamers that are um disabled what are your views there because it's in in a way it reminds me of um you know there are some female only tournaments and there are some people that say yep this is great because it promotes more females to get involved and then there's a, another school of thinking that says well hang on esports is mixed and open to everyone so i'll be interested to hear your thoughts there yeah we we had a situation um very recently with regards to that with the w series so as many people know, with, with motor racing, because it's all stopped, mm. everybody has come on board on the sim racing bandwagon, as it were. So what was a, a niche hobby for a lot of people has now become the mainstream. Mm. And the W Series is a championship, a single-seater a single -seater formula style car championship exclusively for women. Mm. And they introduced an eSports series uh, to dovetail um their season while we're in lockdown and there was a lot of controversy to it because 
the the general attitude within esports is is open to all so why do we need to segregate mm. um and i think it's the same for us as well we pride ourselves on being able to take on the best drivers in the world uh, the best sim racers on an equal playing field we adapt our technology to make it work for us but we can compete with with the best so why would we want to then separate ourselves um into our own little bubble uh for us you know i say it's it's a case of adapt but compete on a level playing field mm. what do you guys think do you have thoughts on that terry jake yeah i don't i i don't it's a difficult question isn't it you don't want to you don't want to segregate people but at the same time you want to have it's a bit it's a little bit like having a, a top tier af, uh, athlete fight uh, running against somebody who isn't as physically able now it doesn't it, it at the start it just makes it slightly unfair if if I'm being and I'm not being harsh I'm trying not to I'm trying to be sensitive at the same time hmm. but you know you're, it's difficult to level to, to have it equal without there being um, like for the right equipment or the right in in our case in esports right hardware and software which which makes it level but at the same time doesn't then give the the person who is using those tools to help um like surpass them like if they are a really good gamer for example mm. uh, you know that it doesn't make them too good as an example and i think that's going to take a little while to get used to um especially for the top tier leagues to be able to um, allow the, those kind of software and hardware in without rubbing the top teams like the wrong way so to speak mm. um but i do think it's going to take a little while yeah um i would say though that um you know i i compete in um a few of the there's loads and loads of different esports tournaments that you can go on to you know i compete in the all for one tournament um there's the oversalt tournament i don't know if it's specific to overwatch but this is the same for and many different types of games you've got loads of stuff on battlefy and it doesn't matter how you play um, what level you are um, you still get to experience esports in a competitive environment um, no matter how good or how not good you are um, from your from your own personal opinion so i think that there's still ways that people can access esports mm. um, i'm not sure about how accessible it is then to get into you know the top elite here yet i think another thing to to, to think about is if, if you were to segregate disability being such a a wide spectrum um i mean for someone like myself i'm on the autistic spectrum uh but i compete with fundamentally a, a normal setup i've got a wheel i've got a pedal set i've got a shifter as well for depending on the car i'm driving mm -hmm. but where do you draw the line between what disabilities can run and what disabilities can't i mean uh one of my teammates uses a um one of our hand control systems he uses the paddles on the back as his brake and his uh, and his accelerator and he's got further two paddles for gears fundamentally the inputs are the same where he pulls a paddle where i push down on a pedal um yes he's quicker than me but i think that's because he's just a better driver not because his mm -hmm. equipment is giving him an unfair advantage yeah. if anything it gives him a bit of a disadvantage because whereas with a pedal i've got um more of a throw and i can uh, i can fine tune more so how much input i want for him he's got he's he's got a tiny amount of movement within the paddle mm. so in that sense i've i've never come across certainly from an esports perspective where somebody has an unfair advantage by their equipment because fundamentally it's buttons it's potentiometers it's it's just inputs into a system um whereas if it was something like athletics where we had oscar pistorius racing um in the in the main olympics uh there were there were talks whether his blades with the flex in in that were giving him an unfair advantage um whereas that's more a focus on the individual rather than whereas with gaming it is it's an input it's a means to an input 
Absolutely. And Terry and Jake as well, I wanted to ask you as well, because I was talking about specific tournaments and things. <clears throat> Special Effect has held several sort of industry tournaments and also Autistic has done a few bits with Enemy of Boredom, if I'm not mistaken, Jake. So maybe you could tell us a bit about those initiatives and how they've gone. Yeah, so I mean, well, be, before we move on that, I was just um, waiting to uh, <laughs> take my turn and listen. No to worries, go for I it. I think... Um, it's definitely like uh, like Max and Terry have said. There's so many so many nuances mm. to um, to diversity and so many factors to consider. I think like what, like uh, Max mentioned, when it comes to the input to the system, you know, there's um, even if you just take um, if you don't take into any consideration the, the the diversity, the physical or neurological diversity, and you have two um, uh, two players that are both uh, physically and neurologically the same. One's using a standard, I don't know, PS4 controller, uh, and one's using uh, a fight stick, or one's using um, one of those uh, controllers that have extra buttons on the back. Mm. Those do create nuanced differences in terms of accessibility and input, and those could be argued to be different levels of um, advantages. Um, mm. And I'm definitely uh, in the camp of when it comes to uh, gender diversity, uh, I think, obviously, while it makes sense, I think in the physical realm, Due to the differences in the the um, the gendered uh, abilities of muscle mass, bone density, all that stuff that's been researched. When it comes to esports and, and digital sports, for for me, it's definitely a, a concept of, of, of the mind. So I, I don't see why there is uh, gender division. I think that's definitely something that is nuanced and needs to be looked at in terms of having mixed gender teams and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, onto the uh, things that we've done at Testica, um in the last year and a bit. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, a weekend where we just wanted to create a space where it was accessible for all people to come together. Because um, as we all know, sometimes playing online, it can be quite a treacherous minefield. And if you're not the best or if you make uh, mistakes or, you know, whatever it be, I don't know whether it's you're playing on Destiny and Patch or you're, you're lacking a bit in the raid or something like that. People could be quite mean and, you know, disregard your, 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 your trying. Um, I've been on the receiving end of that. Um, and so we just created a, a weekend after, um, <clears throat> it was one week after World Mental Health uh, Day. Mm. It was just a weekend where people come together and basically um, for, for all the kind of streamers, uh, influencers, people that have uh, fancy setups, like this kind of setup, you know, we're all here together. And, and people that have like lights and, and, and they play the games that their audiences want to see. Just kind of strip all that down. Talk about yourself as a person, your, um, your mental health, uh, things that you found important on World Mental Health Day. And just come together in an understanding that the conversations that are happening on those streams that are taking part are just about um, being inclusive and, and, and having a conversation and, and being able to be open and converse these things with your communities and with yourself and you know just in a space that's um safe really and then the other thing was earlier this year it's not esports but we did have a, a game jam with um the tentacle zone at payload studios where we invited everyone to participate and um create games based on um research um and these research uh um, these research areas were based on three things so um, co-occurring mental health conditions uh, because you find that there is a, a lot higher percentage in autistic people than neurotypical people when it comes to co-occurring mental health conditions um, mm -hmm. and then um, employability because we find that um, while there's 16 percent of autistic people are hired uh, 77 percent uh, want to work and it's it's a massive disparity and um, something we want to raise attention to. Uh, and then the third one was around um, alternative communication methods um, because there's uh, obviously uh, one in four autistic people who are um, minimally or nonverbal. So uh, we had lots of people come together and create games. And many of those games were created by autistic people themselves. Many people have never taken part in a game jam. So again, it just shows the value of when we create a space that is accessible and we promote it as accessible and we kind of say that it's open for all, you do kind of open a door that even if it's not, even if it's not closed beforehand, just being aware of the terminology that we use and being aware of, of the way we present certain things, it does allow those people that want to take part but don't feel they're able to take part. It kind of allows them to um, feel that they're welcome. 
but I feel like I've waffled now, so I'll stop there. No, that's good. <laughs> You're doing a lot of good work uh, there, and I can <clears throat> confirm, speaking from experience, game jams are a lot of fun. I did one with Yuki last year, and we had to do a game in whatever it was, 48 hours, and that was a good chat. It's a good way of getting to know other people, you know, teamwork, having fun in a way that uh, esports can't offer, but it's still quite competitive because you're trying to make a game that's better than the other people. Exactly. So you're up and, against and also, the clock. Just on that as well, because that is an important thing, is a part of um, a part of the reason why we did the, the game jam was because of that, like you just mentioned, 48 hours. Mm. You know, I've, I've been in game jams before and it's a physical space, closed environment, 48, 72 hours. It's quite intense mm. and it's quite male dominated. So a lot of these physical game jams can be quite exclusionary just in the way that they're set up. So we created this game jam that took place over a week and two weekends. Um, and, you know, it was just anyone can take part in whatever mm. way they want. We were available on stream and on Discord every day for anyone that wanted to uh, be a part. The only thing that was set in stone was the submission of the game um, at the end of the period, uh, which was, yeah, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 days. Mm. Um, so at the end of that, you could submit something. That was the only rule that was set. Um, and we found, yeah, it was just loads of people took part that said they'd never taken part before. Um, so definitely something we're looking at doing again. That's great. And and Terry, any uh, examples of things that Special Effects has done? They did a, like some industry bits, right, to raise money, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, would, I would just want to say game jams are awesome. Um, yeah. I haven't taken part in one, but I've um, attended Eurogamer a number of times and Rezzed, where they hold a couple of game jams they've held in the last couple of years. Um, and it's pretty cool seeing what they can do in like two days. It's like it would take me like a year to do that, <laughs> close to that. Um, but um, yeah, special effect do um, quite load loads of stuff. Um, lots of lots of marathons and stuff to help raise money to keep fit, which is really good for your mental mental health. Um, but in terms of the gaming, um, they have done the chicken for charity the last couple of years. That's it, yeah. Uh, which is um, spe uh, specifically for PUBG. Um, but they have tried it. I think they were going to try it with a couple of the other kind of Fortnite or other Battle Royale games. So I guess they could look into Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. um, kind of looking for a chicken chin uh, winner, winner, chicken dinner type type thing. Um, and then um, they do the Game Blast as well, um, which they've had games like CS:GO and um, other other competitive games where they try and get um, people within the industry to compete with each other. Yeah. Um, just to get to get people to have a bit of fun um, and see which which studio is the best, um, and then they do stuff like uh, six aside football tournaments as well. Um, yeah, they do quite a few, a few different bits. I think. But yeah, that's great. Um, just want to say something uh, for people watching on the stream. I should have said this at the start. If you have any questions for the panel, um, please ask them in the Twitch chat, and I'll try and come on to them when I can or, or near the end. Uh, another thing. Anyone who wants to sub or donate uh, to the British Esports Twitch channel this month, we're giving, or well, this month and next month, we're giving all the proceeds to the National Video Game Museum, who have been, you know, facing some challenges due to uh, lockdown and so on. I know the Yogs cast did a lot for them, but we're we're helping out a little bit as well. And there's some exclusive, there's some new emotes and things. If Elliot's still in the chat, my my colleague Elliot or any of the uh, mods we've got. There's a few emotes and things that they might be able to show off. We've just had those designed, some really cool like lion emotes and things like that. Um, there we go, Elliot's put some in there. There's actually a Sacco's Snacko's <laughs> emote, which, oh God, I'm going to have to do some streams based on, I don't know, making cakes and goodness knows what. I need to think about that. Uh, and, and then lastly, someone said in the chat, guys, SideQuest HQ said, I'm currently developing a service to help young people with disabilities and mental health conditions to find rewarding careers in the games industry. I would love to speak with you all about how best to, um, to support those young people. And that's from someone called Brandon. So maybe after this, Brandon, we can put you in touch and um, discuss more. Um, so that's a little bit of, of an update on the stream. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, guys, I saw last week Twitch actually put out some information around Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Now, I feel bad because I've missed this day last week and it would have made sense to tie this stream in with that. But hey, we're only a few days late, so it's not too bad. And, and Twitch were talking about how it's making Twitch uh, a more digitally accessible, accessible place. And of course, streaming offers uh, an avenue for disabled and neurodiverse 
diverse gamers. Um, you know, I follow a few streamers. Uh, um, I think it's No Hands Ken, um, who is uh, paraplegic, I believe, and um, but he streams, streams Diablo and things like that. And it offers an avenue for these types of gamers. You know, what do you think of that? Are you are you guys using streaming platforms to do a similar thing? Are you encouraged by what Twitch offers those types of gamers? Yeah, I think from the perspective of us, we we use um, we use uh, streaming quite predominantly. So as so as well as running um, a sim racing team, we put on events as well. And what we like about about those events is we can showcase who we are, what we're about, what we're doing, uh, not just in esports, but in real world as well, uh, supporting disabled people. And then usually it follows by a race where our disabled drivers are then mixing it with some of the biggest names in motorsport. Um, so from our perspective, uh, yes, it is, it is a positive thing. Um, and also, you know, it, we have individual drivers that will, will stream as well, and it gives them an opportunity to sort of show their personalities as well. Um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions around certain disabilities, mm. um, particularly with say uh, autistic people. One of the things I get told a lot is they're surprised I have a sense of humour. Uh, you know, we're, we're most autistic people are apparently quite straight laced and sort of blinkered to the rest of the world. Whereas mm. I think by having that opportunity to, to sort of broadcast ourselves, people realize that actually we're, we're nice people. Um, and, and you know, they, they want us to be involved uh, with themselves. That's, that's great. How about you guys, Terry, Jake, any views there? Yeah, I mean, if I could just jump in there, like exactly, like that's, that's one of the reasons why um, I, I joined Autistica. So for those in chat that don't know, um, come from the games industry, worked for uh, Japanese publishers, um, and kind of throughout the years, uh, obviously uh, interacted with many uh, neurodiverse people, many autistic people, uh, fellow gamers, and uh, just kind of became increasingly aware of the accessibility and kind of a lot of those myths and kind of things that people like Max just said, you know, the fact about not having a humor when in fact, you know, um, some of my artistic friends are the most uh, sarcastic and amazing people that leave me in the dust. Um, and it's just, that was one of the main things for me joining Autistica was um, just being part of the conversation, being part of that change, making sure that the games industry is more accessible to um, a massive swell of people that are um, uh, using their products and, and working in the industry. Um, and uh, mm. yeah, I mean, <laughs> I kind of lost my uh, my point there, but it was literally just I just wanted to jump on that and just say yeah, exactly yeah. what Max said. I just about... I know what you mean, and I think for me it's like when I when I joined one of my uh, one of my previous companies, I I, t I turn around to my boss, and I'm I'm sure you probably won't mind me mentioning his name. His name is Chris Andrew, and I said to him when I joined the company, "Don't treat me different. Treat." don't treat me max the the autistic guy treat me as max treat me like you would all the other guys and i think by treating me like one of the others i kind of learned an ability to to sort of read the room i was in get a feel for the the, the sort of sense of humor that i was surrounded by and and you sort of subconsciously you build confidence from it and and by, and as I say, because they're willing to just treat you as 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 an as an equal, you 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 flourish in that sort of environment. And uh, I think Chris was uh, quite instrumental to that for me. Um, and it meant that when I talk to people in the the wider industry, you know, nobody thinks that you know my autism is rarely mentioned now. Um, it's only sort of in this these sort of circumstances where. Um, it, it does get mentioned, but otherwise, I, I'm just Max, uh, exactly. and, and people just like having me around, which is which is a, a good thing. And it's the same for a lot of drivers. I mean, one of our drivers, Sandro, uh, we were we were competing in a race, and um, he told he's he's 13, and he was telling off a driver who was probably three times his age about <laughs> about a movie made into one of the corners. I just you could hear the whole chat erupting with laughter. <laughs> the way he was just so serious. And he said, you shouldn't be dive bombing into that corner. Show some respect. 
Do you know yeah. what? Those are some brilliant answers. I this is the the thing about I like about Twitch as well is that I find myself doing it. I don't stream much because I don't have much time. Um, I would like to stream gameplay and things like that. Once you get into the zone in Twitch, it's almost like the chat aren't there. I mean, in my case, uh, on my own personal channel, the chat aren't there anyway because I'm not a popular streamer. But you know what I mean, right? Um, you're, you're sort of streaming. It's like a stream of consciousness. You're talking to the camera. You're really in your zone. You're yourself. So I think... What you were saying, Max and Jake, about you know being yourself and being in an environment where you're just treated as a normal person, which should be the case anyway, right? Um, Twitch lends itself to that pretty well, I think. Once you get in that zone, it's you in front of the camera. It's very, um, it highlights your personality. You know, I think that's fair to say. Obviously, there'll be people in the chat, um, and I'm sure. You know, there are streamers out there that they'll have toxic people in the chat, and that's another thing entirely. But I just, my point is, this digital age we're in, I think, allows people to express themselves and be themselves. One hundred percent. I think it's it's really important at this point to just mention about how during this pandemic, this has been such an amazing opportunity. While it's obviously a terrible situation that we find ourselves in, and there's so many people that are struggling so much more. I mean, I'm so grateful mm-hmm. for the fact that. You know, we're able to have this conversation now. We all have our jobs and we're, we're able to do this. But so many other people don't have that opportunity, don't have that. But I think one of the silver linings through this pandemic is all these digital events. For example, this conversation that we're having now, would it or would not, would it or would it not be digital? Who knows? Uh, for example, the uh, Autistic Play event that we hold uh, during World Autism Awareness Week. You know, this uh, year we plan on doing it at the BFI, as always bringing together uh, autism research in the games industry, um, which is where we actually had um, Enemy of Boredom. They brought down some of their students, some of which were autistic, uh, and they the, the students held a mini uh, Smash Bros tournament as part of the cool. um, activities as part of the event. Um, so we held it digitally this year just because of the pandemic. Uh, but I think the, the digital platforms, they allow, again, um, so much more accessibility, uh, whether it be something like uh, geographical, uh, financial barriers, but also um, neurological barriers. You know, there's a lot of boundaries that are in the the physical world. Um, And, you know, while uh, some people might be uh, just fine to navigate the physical world, um, neurodiversity, uh, autism, it's, uh, you know, to to, to use the word spectrum. And, um, you know, this means that for a lot of people, they can't participate in those events, you know, especially yeah. when it comes to esports events or, or our games industry events that can be really overwhelming with sensory input uh, and just the amount of people. Even for me, it's like really overwhelming. So these digital platforms really do allow us to open up our doors and, and reach a new audience. One of the um, first things we did uh, when I joined Autistica was get Autistica set up on um, on Twitch. We have a channel, yeah. Autistica Play. Uh, we've used it a few times uh, and we did a thanking day, which is where people in the charity, uh, for those of you that don't know, Autistica is a small charity, uh, 20 people, um, and we're not government funded, so everything we do is purely with generosity of the people. Um, we basically streamed for six hours, which in itself was a challenge. Uh, we had loads of different people coming in throughout the day, just talking about what they do at the charity. We had researchers, uh, director of science, various different people that represent different things. Um, and yeah, like you said, you get toxic people. I mean, that's that's part and parcel with the platform. But the the positive is we're we're being accessible to an entire new audience, and mm. that's something you can't get. For example, if we did this physical um, in London, mm. uh, you know that that means our audience is is going to be a lot smaller, just because of the nature of the physicality of it. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, Terry, I'm conscious we haven't allowed you to speak. That's fine. On this. No, I mean uh, the internet's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Like I remember 15, 20 years ago when I'd have to drag my Xbox and P- and PC monitor, um, like 20 minutes down the road, just to be able to play some. Uh, LAN, Halo and stuff mm. it's, where it's completely different now um, and you can play with people you know I still play with him but he lives up in Cambridge and I don't have to lug all my gear Yeah, uh, we still do it a couple of times a year um, just to just, I don't know why I don't know why <laughs> there's something to be said about meeting up with your mates monitors yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, 
take my feature in. <laughs> there's still something to be said about that. I, I, I tell you what, guys, at the next Insomnia Gaming Festival or whatever other gaming event, after this lockdown lifts and we have a, a, a vaccine or whatever else, that's going to sell out very quickly <laughs> compared to previous <laughs> events because people are really going to you know, want to go because it's been so long since the last one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had my tickets and everything for the last one. Oh, um, so gutted. Yeah, I, yeah, I was I, looking I, forward to it. I've only attended mm. one before, but that was with special effects, so not kind of bringing a gaming setup and mm. playing for five days straight without a wife or kids to interrupt me. Although, uh, shout out to Epic Land. Um, they've just announced Epic WAN, so it's going to be a digital oh, nice. version. So they've got their pub quiz, and they could try and get yeah, all those yeah, community yeah. activities, so it's not just online gameplay as usual you know and yeah. i'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that i'll, I'll have to i'll have to uh, see if i can join that um right i'm t- conscious of time guys we've got 20 minutes left there's a few more um discussion points here i really want to cover there's one pro player uh, that caught my attention recently called broly legs um who suffers from uh i may pronounce this wrong wrong arthrogryposis a rare genetic condition that seizes up crucial joints in his arms and, and legs. But he plays in fighting game tournaments with his face. I believe he uses his tongue uh, to move the controller and, and things like that, and uses parts of his face. Um, and his motto is, no legs, no hands, no excuses. Um, and he, he said this in a tweet, always been my motto, no matter what obstacle comes my way, I face it head on. Win, lose, win or lose, I'll always try. What, what do you think of that? Do you think Players like that, those those sort of amateur or semi-pro or pro uh, disabled gamers, will inspire other disabled and neurodiverse players to get involved in esports. Or do you not think it matters? Oh, I think so. Like mm-hmm. inspires me to get into it, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, like to to be able to see that from from anyone, you mm-hmm. know, um, especially with somebody who, you know, a, typically a, a controller requires hands in most cases and i know there's a lot of adaptive controller setups now um but you know historically and to not use your hands at all but mm-hmm. still compete at a high level with without using it you know is is mind-blowing and it's awesome to watch absolutely I think, I think for me it's a case of for a lot of people um esports can be seen as a as an escape or or a coping strategy um for me, it, it has proven that, but I think from from where I'm sat here with with E Team Brit, I think for me it it also gives me a platform um, to sort of say to other other disabled people, it's like, look, I've I've had my struggles, um, but I found ways around them, and we're here to to help you, and and we I I want to be you know. 10, 15 years down the line, having brought somebody in into our team who, who maybe was struggling to get work or couldn't make friends to, to, to flourish, really. And mm. and I think, as you say, having the platform to, to promote yourself, um, there, there's an element of responsibility to, to, to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. Jake, do you have any thoughts there? Is it, I guess it is inspiring, isn't it? Those those kind of tweets. I found it inspiring, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, for it's it's amazing to know that there's people that are playing, competing at you know champion level without the use of you know the tradition of using your hands to play games. I mean, that's mm. that's amazing, um, and I think yeah, it is it is vitally important for. Um, representation i think you know while um <clears throat> for some people it, it might not seem like an obvious need it might not seem like you need something because you're not used to being left out of the conversation you're not used to not being seen or not being heard so i think it's definitely empowering uh to show other people that may be f- physiologically or um neurologically um diverse mm-hmm. that they're also able to participate and that they're also included and that you know i mean um probably probably's uh, saying you know uh, what was it uh no no hands no legs no challenge or uh, it's, no, no excuses yeah no excuses <laughs> that's the one yeah. so i mean even, even even for me like you know uh, one of the excuses i use um because i i try my best at um fighting games i'm not very good at it mm. um so i have uh, tumors in my right hand and wrist so i can't really use it 
that well mm. and you know I, I try my best to kind of play but i'm just not very good at you know the the speedy combos um because i don't really have that much mobility in my right hand mm. and i am right-handed um and but then obviously if someone can play it with with, with the, the muscles in their face and the parts of them what excuse have i got you know what i mean so i think it's definitely empowering yeah i think uh, I, I could be wrong i think there might there was someone that played league of legends with their feet I saw a Reddit post a while back, which is quite impressive. I mean, I struggled to play it with my hands in silver and gold ranked ELO, so uh, that, that's encouraging as well. Um, what, one thing I wanted to ask, and this this might be one for you, Jake. We've spoken about this before. You've held uh, uh, events and things in the past, and I asked the, the panellists this question. It seems to have... We seem to have got a little bit better. It, this term doesn't get used as much these days, but... The term autist was still being used as an insult in some video games online. And, um, you know, just by trolls or people that wanted to harass other people. And I personally didn't like that, being used as an insult. There are other words that are used as insults, as of course, that aren't nice as well. But that, I thought, unfairly sort of stigmatised autistic people as well. What, what are your views there? For me, I've, that doesn't seem to be used as much as I saw a year or two ago. So I don't know if that sort of going away a bit now what, what, what are your views yeah so i mean i guess in the the general sense of things i think it's definitely reducing because people are becoming mm. more aware and again this is another reason why i joined testicle because it's so vitally important that we empower those that don't have the knowledge or mm. don't understand to become more understanding become more, more knowledgeable and um, instead of doing it as like just an ad hoc here this might work for you use data and research and and um, directly work with, with the community that you want to represent, yeah. uh, obviously for autistic, that being um, autistic people and their families. Um, but, you know, and, and I think it also depends as well in the circles that you are in, because, um, you know, you could go, uh, if, if, if you're in uh, circles that are maybe more inclusive, then obviously you wouldn't hear it at all. But um, other other circles could be more, I don't know whether it's, it's uh, toxic or, uneducated or just um cat no don't jump up on me now uh, i have a cat that likes to jump up on whenever he hears me talking he comes from nowhere and jumps off my desk um but yeah i think it from what i see um it's definitely used less but it's still used and if it's still going to be used uh, especially in um by uh, influencers and in uh, pop culture then uh, in, in a negative way, that then there's still work that needs to be done to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, just quickly, guys. Um, so Squark uh, said in the chat, "Yes, cat with a sort of sad cat emote." So I think I can... he wants to see the cat now. Okay. I, I want to see the cat. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Oh, another, lovely. another joy of the uh, the home stuff. Oh, yeah. What's his name? Uh, so his name is Kurama which is that Ninetail Fox off Naruto. Yes, ah, I am nice. uh, okay. one of those guys. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, we've got some nice emotes uh, there coming in the chat. Yeah, lovely. Um, did you guys have any view on that? Do you, do you, do you see any insults banded about? The, uh, I think, yeah, I think, I think the, with the, I mean, the term Orst, I'd never heard until it was mentioned here, I must admit. But I think... It, it's funny you, you you kind of see it from from where I see it. You've got two kinds. You've got the, the the situation where you're playing a game, and it could be that uh, somebody keeps shooting this particular person, and you think, "Oh my god, he's being an idiot! What an absolute mm -hmm. whatever!" And it could be that he might use a term that in his country, in his language, is may be seen as less derogatory than it is in say the uk so like say for example retard in america it does mm, yeah. mean you are yeah. of a, a lower mental capacity whereas in the uk it's deemed an insult um but i think in t if you looked at something like twitter or social media where people would 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 jump on that i think those are the kind of people who would jump on you because you're fat or because you're transgender mm. or because mm. you're you know, because you're autistic or because you're in a wheelchair, they they will just latch on to whatever they disadvantages they feel you've got. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody will specifically target an individual 
certainly from an ease uh, from a racing perspective mm. because of the disability um a lot of the time as i said it's pr- overwhelmingly positive uh, yeah. i've never come across certainly racing somebody attack us because we're a disabled team mm. Okay, well, that's good to hear. And so Squark said in the chat, I've seen less and less insults like that being thrown around. I think insults like that are, are, are like trends on the internet. Um, it makes a point, you know, when I was at school, um, the term gay was used as an insult and that was commonly accepted as an insult. And then you grow up and realise, hang on, well, what yep. are we doing there? He's, we're copying each other, but actually we shouldn't be saying that, you know. Um uh, just conscious, guys. We've got ten minutes left. Sorry, Terry. Did you have? Did you want to add anything on that topic uh, before we moved on? Yeah, like I, I would agree that it's definitely reducing. So before I do what I do now, which I've done for about eighteen months now, mm. um, I worked in education for eleven years. Um, so in a secondary school, um, mostly with mostly with the older end, so fifteen to eighteen. Um, obviously, in a school environment, um, it's still there's still words being thrown around. Um, they're still understanding the reason why some some insults are particularly worse than mm. others, although all insults are. You know, they're just trying to be be cool or be different. Um, and I think it's that that word of of not not accepting difference um, when you're younger, which I think is becoming um, better now. Mm. You know, it, it would be really boring if everybody liked the same music and everybody liked the same food, but and everyone wore the same clothes, but they still focus on that. Oh, you haven't got Nike trainers on, or why are you listening to that band? You're a grunge or whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I liked rock music. I got called a grunge, and it's like, same. but why does that? What, what's the difference? You know, yeah. there's no difference between us. Um, and you know, you mentioned a couple of the terms as well, which kind of got used, but I do think it's being used less. Um, I, I have heard autism being used before and again i i think it's mostly because um they're of them just having a lack of understanding of exactly what they mean mm. um you know it's it's usually either because they don't they don't understand or because they're just trying to trick you one or the other um that's why i feel anyway yeah 100 percent um so Sorry, Terry. Did I did I cut you off there? Was there more? No, no. I was going. I was just going to say I'll stop now because I need ten minutes. No, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So I was just going to say. Well, we're on to nine minutes left, um, guys. And any questions you want to get in, please, please ask us now. I've seen the view numbers have gone up a little bit, and um, it's always a good, uh, you know, advantage to watching these streams live because you get to participate and ask questions live. So you've got a chance to ask some questions now for this great panel. And um, we've had one question earlier, also from SideQuest HQ, who said, "Hi, Dom." Thank you. I'd love to know if the young people that you folks work with are not only interested in, in gaming, but also in working in the games industry, I guess it means in general. And if yes, what careers are they interested in and what are the current barriers? I mean, that's, that's a very broad question. Yeah, we, we get a lot of people at the British Esports Association, obviously, wanting to work in esports. There are a few that come to us who say, oh, Dom, I want to get into games journalism. I want to get into games PR. It's not specifically esports. Do you have any tips? And then I try and... Um, give them some tips or try and put them in touch with some good PR agencies out there or contacts that I have. And I'm guessing for you guys, uh, I mean, E-Team Brit, you have Team Brit as well. So you have the actual physical racing. And then, Jake, you know, you you have various people at your event. There were uh, game developers there and things like that might not be interested in esports, but general games industry. Does anyone want to answer that question? You know, what careers are are people interested in that approach you guys and what are their barriers? Yeah, I mean, for me, the one thing I've learned growing up is if you want to say, as you say, if you want to say get into video game marketing, um, I would say if you're young and you're starting out, don't turn down an opportunity, um, be it as a trainee marketing uh, executive uh, mm. a supermarket for example uh, thinking out loud here because while uh, for me getting to work in esports getting to work with sim racing is really cool the skills i learn to do this i've learned in other industries so right. running running an esports team is very much like running a business um because at the end of the day it's got to be profitable um, I learned 
those skills running a tool company. Um, and I also learned those within the motor trade and working in car dealerships and, and uh, various other businesses. Uh, at one point I was working in electronics disposal. Um, but there's patterns and those skill sets will help you that once you've got those skill sets, then you can afford to be fussy about what kind of industry you work in because you've mm -hmm. got the skill set behind you. I guess um, like talking to a lot of the students, um, and I know I'm a bit a year out of date now, um, but it's I think it's them trying to learn the breadth of job roles within an industry within the gaming industry um, and then esports so you know it's a little bit like football i would i i kind of related to football everybody who really likes football wants to be, become a top football player for whatever barcelona man united whatever they want to do mm. without seeing that just the football team alone has you know business and finance and marketing and um, all the coaching and all the medical sides and it's the same with games you know you've still got people who need to run the office you've still got people who need to do a marketing you've still got people who've got to do pr and hr and take care of your staff um, and you've got all the journalism and then in in esports you've got all the production so you've got filming um all the crews all the talk show hosts um analysis all the camera so it just goes on and on you have a big list of um job responsibilities that you can use to get into it um into the industry rather than the prime ones from my experience or speaking to students would be become a professional gamer or be a game designer um and that alone that job title of game design is so broad you need to you can't it's quite difficult to go in as a games designer without having a specialism within that as well yeah um, so i think it's more to try and i think students um kind of need more opportunities um to expose them to the world of <clears throat> games and esports a little bit more you know there's lots of events and stuff now but i think there still needs to be more to help them understand what the opportunities there are for them yeah jake any points there uh, before we yeah move? i mean definitely um like what max was saying about you know skills that you can get in other industries mm. don't turn them down because you're trying to get in the games industry um I, i'm definitely an example of that uh, like terry i was in uh, education before um, you know, studied wildlife conservation and biodiversity, planned on becoming the next David Attenborough. <laughs> and then in my free time, started setting up a community. And then the next thing I knew I was in the games industry, you yeah. know, and, and now I'm, I'm joining um, um, a, a charity organization to try and make the games industry more inclusive for uh, autistic people. So, yeah. you know, you and again, I'm still working in the games industry. I'm still my role is still considered within the bubble of the games industry everyone mm. i talk to is in the games industry so but you know if, if i mean my title is a games partnership manager but i work for charity so yeah definitely again and i like what terry was saying is it's not just <clears throat> the games industry isn't just like these sp tiny roles there's there's so many there's so much diversity in the roles that you can do you know like you Absolutely. pointed out uh, the finance hr um i i think one of the one of the great um uh, startups or um i think um <clears throat> one that might be worth checking out is into games i don't know if you guys have heard of into games um, yeah so into games are looking at um kind of um collating all the um games industry job roles and kind of highlighting opportunities so that's a good resource to check out um also uh yuki uh early this year released the first games industry uh census yeah that's which really interesting. Uh, presents exactly it's mm. such a powerful tool and really gives us a benchmark of data again an another vitally important thing that autistic does is everything's about data so uh you know you keep presenting that that that's a another great tool to show mm. um the types of people that are in different roles and and what they might experience in those roles uh, uh, and the diversity within those roles. Um, so I think, yeah, I think um, definitely there's resources out there. Just look for them um, and uh, definitely don't, don't dismiss an opportunity because you think it might be not linked to the games industry because you never know. Definitely. We've actually had SideQuest HQ, who's been asking some of these questions, has said, I work at Inter Games, Jake. Oh, there you go. There you go. So if you want to find out more about Inter Games, check the side quest HQ. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, 
I think that's everything, guys. Is there anything else you want to add? Because we've covered a nice broad range here. Is there anything else you want to squeeze in? Any shout outs or anything we might have missed? Um, for myself, obviously, um, you know, we uh, we are a team, so and we we are recruiting drivers. So mm. um, if if you or, or somebody you know is a keen sim racer mm. and they want to maybe get take it a bit more seriously or get involved with a uh, with like-minded people who mm. can support them and grow them and, and, and give them opportunities to race in uh, against drivers and, and in events that they maybe didn't think were possible before, then they can give us a shout. But, you know, as, as us as a team and we grow, there are going to be other opportunities uh, moving forward. So, and, and again, you know, they'll be open up to, to disabled people. It's not just drivers we need. Um so yeah, so if if you feel you can offer a role to us, um, the, and and we can see benefit in that, then yeah, by all means, just um, give us a shout. Uh, they can catch us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, uh, they can also find us on Discord as well. Great stuff, Terry, Jake. Can you find the words? Shall I go first, or something? Uh, just yeah, uh, just to shout out for special effects. Um, you know, if uh, they, they help. Uh, a little bit like with Max, um, they um, aren't aren't state funded, so they they get all their funding through um, through donations or through fundraising. Um, and with a number of events that have been cancelled recently, kind of their publicity, mm -hmm. at least in person, has changed, mm -hmm. uh, been reduced quite a bit. Um, so if you even want to find out about how you can help raise them through you know streams and stuff, which you can do anytime really, which lots of people do, that'd be really cool. Um, but also if you um, or you know somebody um, who who might benefit from custom setups, whether that's on PC or console, um, through whether they have problems with mobility or being able to hold a controller or hold or be able to control a mouse and keyboard with their hands. Um, they have um, they do a lot of work um, by going out to people's houses um, and doing custom setups to let to help anybody play games. Um, so honestly, they've helped um, people who are um, almost completely paralysed. Um, whether they were born with it or had an accident when they were growing up. So please um, make sure you just have a look. You just search special effect online and then have a look at some of their case studies. Um, hopefully that can help. Great stuff. Final word to you then, Jack. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, uh, Autistica faced a similar challenge, not government funded. Um, and in this current uh, situation that we all find ourselves, their income has obviously been greatly impacted. Um, all of us autistic have uh, taken a reduction of 20%. Uh, so, you know, during this time, we're all taking uh, reduced working and uh, mm -hmm. reduced income to kind of help the charity through this challenging period. Um, and yeah, autistic play is uh, relatively new. It's a year and a half. Um, but the purpose is literally just to um, uh, support autistic talent in and coming into the games industry, um, increase understanding and awareness of autism, mm -hmm. and ultimately raise vital funds for the autism research that is so vitally needed and i think um now more than ever uh i think it's really important um th that uh autistic people are not forgotten because obviously while some are able to flourish there's others that need so much more support um and uh if, if and also um if anyone needs any resources or information uh on on covid um we've shifted our focus to kind of be a major resource hub so do check out right. autistica there's loads of information there whether uh, you want information for yourself or whether you're an employee uh, sorry an employer and you want information for your staff and how to kind of manage your 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 company your studio whatever it be um autistica are focused on that uh, with a program called dare discover autism research and employment uh, which is a big thing uh, of, that i hold uh, personally i think it is, is really important um, when it comes to uh, increasing the inclusivity of the games industry in terms yeah. of employment. Uh, so do check out Autistica um, or Autistica Play if you're interested in the game side. Um, yeah, that's it. Great stuff. Well, thanks once again, guys. I appreciate it, especially on a bank holiday Monday. And it's lovely weather out there. So if you've got gardens and things, I know I'm going to be going out uh, my garden for a little bit um thank you very much for tuning in um so i'll say goodbye to you guys now and then end our video call and then i'll just stay on the stream just to talk to the 
chat about a few other things British Esports is doing. So thanks again, and thanks for people in the chat watching. This VOD will be posted on YouTube and across our socials over the next week or two. Um, so thanks very much, uh, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, thank you. and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Thank Take you, care. Appreciate it. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Bye now. Bye. Hello everyone, thanks again uh, for tuning in uh, today. I just wanted to say, um, to mention uh, some exciting initiatives that the British Esports Association are doing this week. Elliot, there he is in the chat, thanking you all. Thanks Elliot for being around and modding and things like that. There's a, a tournament going on right now. Um, it's the All-Star Showdown. Uh, it's a British Esports Rocket League um, tournament in association with Rocket Kingdom TV and it's looking at some of the best um, student teams across co uh, schools and colleges across the UK and that's taking place all this week. In fact this week's going to be our, most, our busiest week on the British Esports uh, Twitch channel and with Rocket Kingdom TV. So there's a schedule um, below, you can see um, when the streams are taking place. It's all, I think it's every day this week bar one um, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So come and check it out. The final will be on Friday. So if you only tune in once, tune in on Friday to see who wins. Um, but uh, yeah, please do stick around for that. And we also have a women in esports stream on Wednesday. I think at 4 p.m. I hope I'm right there. Um, which is looking at. It's going to be a fun stream. It's not going to be a panel discussion because I know we do a lot of panel discussions here. So we're trying to vary it up a bit. It's going to be a pummel party um, session, which I'm told is a very fun game. I've never played it myself, so I'm going to tune in and see what that's like. So that's Wednesday at 4 p.m. I think. And uh, as Elliot said, we're going to raid Rocket Kingdom TV now. Elliot, please do do work your raid magic after this stream. Thanks again, everyone, uh, for tuning in. And Sacco signing off for now. <laughs>